and learn without getting that pitch every time at the end of the meeting and things like that. So that's where Phoebe was born and now we're a nonprofit organization. We, um, we basically teach financial education and real estate education and have multiple chapters throughout Southern California. Um, we have one in Orange County. Uh, we have one in Pasadena. Uh, I run the Long Beach one. David and I run this one as well. And um, we've been doing this since 2012 on this one. So, and uh, I was running Long Beach for 2009 or something like that. So um, it's actually, we it's been one of the best things that have really compounded our relationship bases and our businesses as a whole. Just because we can't do this without each other. And this is actually really, really huge. Like we come up here and learn as well from some great speakers and top people in their fields that know what they're doing. And it's really hugely valuable. So if you guys really want to learn about real estate and get started, or or even if you're seasoned and want to learn, learn some new tools for the tool belt, then you know feel free to come to our events and you know you can find us on meetup.com and uh, uh, fi uh, and type in fibi or you can go to our website for investors by investors.com. So uh, that being said, you want to talk about our sponsors real quick and then um, yeah, we'll go into it. how you guys doing? Yeah. yeah. So if, if you need more chairs, we have some chairs stacked up behind this wall. Feel free to grab a chair and get comfortable. Uh, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Um, you know, as Matt said, we started this group in uh, 2012. Uh, Phoebe itself has been around for 10 years. We've got uh, six chapters uh, active in Southern California, over, I think we're close to almost 28,000 members now um, throughout Southern California. And I get asked all the time, like, you know, how do I invest in Phoebe? And I'm like, there, there is no investing in Phoebe. We're, we're, we're not, this isn't a club where we're all going to pool our money together. That's not what Phoebe's all about. But I will tell you that every real estate investment deal I've ever done, somehow, some way, Phoebe's connected to it. I met someone, I met a resource, I met someone who had a property for sale, I met a lender. Like, so, so really, the, the power of Phoebe, A, will be in the education tonight. We've got a fantastic panel, three really good speakers. Um, you know, for this particular club, we always try to find people, and don't take this the wrong way, that aren't polished speakers. And I say that, not that these guys aren't polished. Uh. <laughs> Trust me, for your, for your benefit, it is, this, these aren't, they're not here to put you into their books and tapes. This isn't going to be at the end of this thing. We've got a four-day boot camp next week, and we're not going to have $15,000 of credit card charges as you walk out the back door. These are people that are active in the space every single day and whatever the topic is, and really we're here to tap their professional knowledge, not the, the thing they're trying to sell you to make money off of you. Any fee you go to, our club, or anywhere in Southern California, that's the same, the same body, right? People are just there to give them information. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about creative ways to fund your real estate deals. Um, you know, we do have some questions that we put together, but this is meant to be an interactive forum. So if you have a question, raise your hand. We will try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, if you need to stand up in the back, we kind of leave some space in the back. You know, some people it's hard to sit for, still for an hour and 45 minutes. Um, we get that, stand up, walk around the back. If we still have some drinks and food here, so if you want to grab something, just go around this side back, uh, this door back over here. You can get back around and, and grab a coffee or beer or wine, whatever you're drinking. Um, we have uh, our meeting next month, which will probably be going up um, uh, later on this week. Uh, in, in May, we're actually going to be talking about um, just some interesting uh, investing strategies. Uh, so the, the guys that started Phoebe, you know, Matt mentioned uh, Jeremy Roll and Ellis San Jose are people that started Phoebe about 10 years ago. And last year, um, Jeremy actually was a 10-year, he had been out of the corporate world as a, as a full-time private investor. And to celebrate, he wanted to go to Las Vegas, um, which if anyone knows Jeremy, Jeremy going to Vegas is like grabbing a bag of pennies and getting on a plane and going to Las Vegas. He's a very, very frugal guy, terrified, <laughs> terrified to make any kind of bet on anything. So, he's gonna love you, right? <laughs> so, so last year we got a group of us that when it was Matt, it was myself, it was Jeremy, a couple of the guys, and we just talked about investing in general and things that we're all doing. It, it was it ended up being this really interesting conversation. So next month. We're basically going to take our Vegas group off the pool, put them up here on a panel, and we're just going to kind of do a roundtable discussion on things that we're all currently involved in advertising, hard in, in, in real estate investing. So, super good panel next month. Um, actually, for Matt, Matt also runs the Long Beach group, and where, where are you going to be this month? I'm going to 
to speak in uh, Seattle. There are like 600 people on the call. It's called the PNW Big Badass Real Estate event, uh, uh, Networking Group or something like that. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like this guy is this guy named Taro is uh, uh, throwing this, and it's like a four-day event. And there's going to be all kinds of amazing, crazy speakers there doing all kinds of stuff. He has to be talking about taxes, of course. So, uh, so, uh, I, I got to make that lively. Like, really, look, you can make this kind of a return inside your 401k. Awesome. You know, so, which is, you know, it's it's pretty cool to be able to do that. But at the same time, like, um, no, that, that's going to be some great. There's going to be some great speakers. <laughs> it's, it's in Seattle. No one's going to buy it. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> that, that's big time now. I'm going to speak in front of 600 people. So actually, I'm going to be running his group uh, later this month uh, in Long Beach. And we're going to do a, a speech on investing uh, with the, uh, the, the housing shortage here in Southern California, how to, how to profit off of the housing shortage in Southern California. So uh, that's going to be April the 26th. Um, the way we run this, you know, obviously we're not making money off of the off of this. As Matt mentioned, we are an official nonprofit for Phoebe, so any money that, that we make from here, we just invest it back into the brand of Phoebe. Uh, and the way we, we kind of fund this, because clearly your $20 isn't getting us to the finish line here, <laughs> we, we do have a couple of uh, sponsors that we want to acknowledge. So first of all, Uterect IRA. Actually, Karen Hall here is the owner of Uterect IRA. Uh, and we're going to talk a lot tonight about self-directed IRAs, but you know they're, they're one of our go-to companies for anything self-directed. So if you have any questions on that, make sure you talk to Karen after the fact. Uh, is uh, New Western, uh, let's see, he's not here. So New Western Acquisitions, they are a wholesale firm, and they basically do wholesaling on a corporate level. Um, where's Andrew at? Mr. Westling back there. Um, Walker Dunlop, you know, they're a commercial lender, they're not a bank. Um, so his company is a sponsor for, for us. Uh, the Note Assistance Program, um, those guys do a lot of um, uh, note investing, both performing and non-performing notes, they're sponsors. And then Spirit of Woodward is a local firm here that uh, in, in, in Redondo Beach that does real estate and business transactions, so they're one of our sponsors. So if you need a referral on any of those kinds of people, please let us know. We've got some really good people that sponsor the group. Uh, and the last thing I'll tell you before we do introductions here is that this is purely for conversation purposes. Please do not take this as investing advice. Um, while we do have an attorney on the panel and Matt claims to be a CPA, um, this is not meant to be legal or tax advice. So you know, anything that comes across through here, uh, you know, we recommend that you certainly check with your own personal advisors before making any kind of the same investment. Anything else? They didn't cover it. I was tired of listening to me. <laughs> I'm tired of listening to me as well. So. All right, let's start off. Robert, why don't you do an introduction to who you are? Sure. Hi, my name is Robert Fergoso. I've been in business now for 29 years. Started off, uh, I guess, when we came wholesaling. I didn't know that at the time, but wholesaling went into a heart building syndication and house flipping. Started a heart money company with a few guys and uh, built that up for 17 years. I got bought out in 2014. Mess around for a couple of years and then kind of got back into flipping. So if you guys need capital, that guy's probably the guy. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah. 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 How's yeah. retirement right now, man? Yeah. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't go so well. Yeah. It was still kind of, flipping. You still got the bug. It's still, still flipping. Flipping's great. It's awesome. It's kind of my, my artistic outlay for things and houses. And we kind of created a new style of house that is getting a lot of traction now, so it's, it's, it's working out pretty good. Cool. Thanks, Hi, I'm Karen. What do you want me to say here? What do we do? Hi, I'm Karen. <laughs> <laughs> and my company is Udirect IRA Services, and so what we do is help people take their retirement and invest it outside the stock market, which, you know, what's the stock market doing today? Did it go up or down? Yeah, it's been kind of all this time. <laughs> so, you know, it's going to be crazy. So if, if you either if you're a real estate investor and you think, hey, this is the asset class I really understand, that's the number one asset class people um, use in their self-directed IRA is real estate. So you've got the choice of putting your 401k uh, money rolling it over or your IRA money uh, into the stock market or into assets that you know and understand like real estate. And that's what we all do. So you open an account, you fund it, then you can invest in everything we're going to be talking about tonight. You know, real estate, syndications, private notes. Uh, 
follow the instructions. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Carol Glover. Uh, I am a real estate attorney uh, for about 28 years now. I wear three hats. Um, I'm a broker, uh, so I do um, real estate transactions. I've, I've done some brokerage work, um, as well as do a lot of transactions for my own account. Um, but I've also helped clients with, uh, you know, just buying and selling homes, um, investments, apartment buildings. Um, I uh, am a real estate lawyer. I am associated with a business firm uh, here in town, and uh, so they handle the business transactions, which I also used to do, but I exclusively handle commercial um, real estate transactions, which is purchase and sale and leasing. Um, and then I also, uh, with my partner Dave back there in the back of the room, um, I have a development company. So we uh, flip properties um, and we've done uh, value add for apartment buildings, um, a lot of residential in the greater South Bay area. We, we kind of you know joke that we have a, a chain on the bumper of our cars. We don't, we don't go too far afield. We don't do out of state um, flipping. Um, and then we also um, had just recently completed a, a commercial uh, uh, renovation in Hermosa Beach on PCH, which was interesting, a lot of fun, a lot of challenges, but uh, I like it. I like commercials, so we're going to be doing more of that. Hi, I'm Matthew Owens. I'm a California licensed CPA still, even though I won't do your taxes. <laughs> it's no fun doing taxes. I don't like to pay the any more money than anybody has to. So, anyway. So. There's my libertarian side of things in for you. So, um, so I, I flip probably about five to ten houses a month. I've done over 600 now in the last ten years. We do a lot of value add multifamilies. Um, we um, invest in different syndicated investments like self storage, or home parks, and uh, different other multifamilies. Um, we also uh, lend capital, do short term rentals, and do quite a bit of different strategies in real estate, including you know. Uh, non-performing notes and things like that too. So try to get different income streams going in different ways um, to completely you know, solidify cash flow streams and stuff like that. So it's a lot more fun than doing taxes. <laughs> Is it everything more fun than doing taxes? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, my name is David Coe, so uh, welcome to our office here. I'm a Keller Williams agent, uh, and we specialize working in the greater South Bay. Uh, but we also work with a lot of investors. And myself as an investor, um, you know, I've done everything from non-performing notes. Uh, I'm a partner in a, a new new construction development project up in North Hollywood. Um, invested in a lot of the syndicated stuff that Matt was kind of talking about. Um, but uh, we, we really work with a lot of residential investors. So actually, Evelyn back there is part of our team. So if you are a residential real estate investor, we'd love to know who you are, what you're doing, just to see if there's any synergy that way. So um, before we kind of jump into the panel, uh, we're, we're gonna go for about an hour and a half, uh, which we have a hard stop at nine o'clock, mostly because we've got a cleaning crew down on this night. They have to wait for us to be done. So as soon as we're done, we're going to have everyone walk across the, 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 the courtyard over here to North Italia. We've got the whole patio reserved with food. It's a cash bar, but we have pizzas and all kinds of stuff. And really, the magic of Phoebe will happen at North Italia. So as soon as we're done here, we're going to ask everyone to, to kind of walk over to North Italia, and then we'll pick up the morning over there. So. Okay, so um, let's let's start off, and Robert, I'm going to kind of throw this first question to you, and then what I want to kind of talk about is just in general, the, the way when you guys are doing your fixing and flipping, what are some of the more, I'll say, general, common ways that we structure real estate deals? So, for, for most of them are either cash or they're leveraged to some degree. Um, I you know, have a bank line credit, it's a more traditional line of credit, and then also a hard money line of credit with my own company. And uh, I'm always kind of chasing the yield, so I look at what the best yield will be. And if it's quick turning deal, then it might be something that we do cash. If it's something that we're gonna fix up, then you know, the yield might be better if we leverage it a little bit. You're saying we, who's we? Um, so I do a lot of partnership deals, so I'm not out there really counting the payment anymore. So generally, either a investor like yourself or a real estate agent or someone that brings me the deal. Um, and so for the most part, uh, that's kind of how I get the deal from that out making offers and kind of meeting with homeowners or doing things like that on my own anymore. Um, most of them come in a partnership facility. Um, there are a lot that I end up doing, but someone initially brought me the deal and maybe they need money, so they'd rather get bought out of the deal. 
and essentially they want as a wholesaler and selling the property. Do you do, uh, like when you have a structure with the deal with them, is that more like a partnership, a joint venture, where you create an entity? No, so generally I take title. Um, we have an agreement, like a joint venture agreement, and I'll, I'll be on title. Um, you know, it depends on the structure, and the structure varies from, sometimes we've done a partnership with the seller because they want to end up with more money, and sometimes they're realistic, and if they're unrealistic, we try to get them to as close to their number as we possibly can. And so, it, you know, there's sometimes where there's a, you know, it might be a 50-50 split with the seller, and then I'm splitting with the agent, and commissions are part of it, so we, um, we end up making a little bit less, but right now, this cycle of the market, I'm a bigger fan of making a little bit less money and having a safer deals to be a part of. And so I, I like being, I, I like knowing that we're going to make money versus having to stretch and then having to be the highest comp. We're usually the highest comp anyway, but you, you know, if the market changes, we still have to make you money. Whereas, you know, if you're buying it, then you're in and all the liability goes towards yourself versus, you know, the distortion to that. It's a great strategy by the way, real estate investing. If you can consistently not lose money, you're trying to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you buy low, sell high, it works almost every time. <laughs> Carl, what about you? I, I know you've got all kinds of creative structures that you're seeing through right. the self directed virus. Why don't you give some idea what the are doing? That's the thing when we're investors, we're creative people, right? You know, we're always looking for a way to make a deal happen. And so with self directed IRAs, Creative structures aren't always the best thing. I mean, there are rules, self-directed IRAs have rules, maybe we'll get into them, maybe we won't. If we don't, call me and we'll chat about it. But with self-directed IRAs, we don't want to see a lot of complicated uh, deals, right? I mean, we're ha we're, we're, whatever we get, we look at. We review we, we, we hundreds of different kinds of deals every day. And if it, it's like it's like your thumbprint. Everybody has a different deal to it differently. I like if it's a note, for example. If it's a note investment, we want to see the basic elements of a note. That it's got a principal amount, that it's got a rate of interest, that it tells us when the payments are going to be made, that we see at least one interest only payment a year, and that there's a maturity date. So those are the basic elements of the note, am I right? Yeah. But we, we get napkins. I mean, you know, and God bless you guys for being incredibly creative investors. But with the self directed IRA, this is precious money, you know, retirement money. It's you are very limited how much you can save. And you want to get the best return, and with self director, we're gonna. We don't tell you what you can and can't do, but we can tell you what is and is not administratively feasible for us. Like as a business decision, what assets we will and won't custody. So that's kind of a question. So we see, you know, the kinds of deals you're talking about. So there, the equity participation deals can lead to, you know, can lead to um, tax. Did you know if an IRA invests in an equity participation note? So do you know what I'm talking about? <coughs> So you, you, there's a rate of interest plus an equity kicker when the deal closes, right? That can lead to a tax. You want to discuss it with your tax advisor called UBIT, Unrelated Business Income Tax. What if you didn't know that? What if your IRA did that kind of long and you didn't know that? Well, that's why you want to call us because we're going to look at it and say, hey, guess what? Did you see this? Did you discuss this with your tax advisor? Did you pencil out the numbers from beginning to end? Is this, you know, so here's the information. This is what you need to ask your CPA. And that's what we want to do. So we see, I mean, creative, 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 but only so much gets through. So, and Karin, I know that we talk about self-directed IRAs, but there's other kinds of retirement accounts you can't self-direct. What other types yeah. of uh, retirement accounts are people using for investors? Yeah, that's a great question. So self-directed IRAs is like an umbrella term. It's, it's the traditional, the Roth, the SEP, which is a simplified employee pension. The simple, by the way, when the government calls something simple, <laughs> okay, it's an acronym. The Savings Incentive Match Plan for Employers. It's, it's out there, not many people use it. We are they have it, but you can use it. There's an inherited IRA. If you have an IRA, you name a beneficiary, you pass away, your beneficiary gets an inherited IRA, and there are lots of rules with that. A spousal IRA, it's a regular IRA, but with, with normal IRAs, you have to have earned income in order to contribute. If you're a non-working spouse of somebody who is employed, you can contribute to an IRA even though you don't have earned income. It's called a spousal IRA. It's really just a traditional Roth that you contribute to as a spouse. So those are the kinds of IRAs that can be self-directed. And also a 401k of an individual business owner. So that has a lot of bells and whistles and it's really cool. And if you're self-employed with no employees, maybe we'll get into that later. But it's a, it's a 401k for a business owner with no full-time employees. It can be a business owner and their spouse interesting because um, but that's that's true uh, so that's a solo form 
Carol, what about when you guys are, I mean, I, you see all kinds of stuff, I'm sure, both as an attorney, but also for your own personal stuff. Like, what, what's your guys' preferred method that you do when you're looking to buy something? And how do you work with investors and how do you structure your deals? Um, well, pretty much the same way that um, Robert talked about, in that we uh, usually have, um, a, we fund uh, a like seven percent uh, loan of value, uh, and we so that's that's the loan part of it, and then we seek the rest of the capital, which is you know the um, composes of the down payment, and then also we weave in our construction budget. budget. And so we have the total purchase price plus our construction budget, and and that's how we purchase it. And we um, depends on the deal. Um, we've done a bunch of different things. We've done uh, notes where they just get a, a interest rate or investors. We've done notes where they get a kicker at the end um, and participate with us in the deal. We've done joint ventures with owners who have been in trouble. Either they need to sell. Um, or they want to sell and they understand that their property is not saleable in its current condition. So we've done joint ventures with them where we've contributed cash to the, to the deal and they've contributed property and then we do the renovations and then we split it at the end on some ratio. Um, and um, those are, those are uh, I like doing those, those are very interesting. It's a, it's a little bit tricky, and you do have to establish the value, and you have to get an agreement from the business owners to what their property is worth in today's market, unfinished, so that you can properly work out um, what the what the profit is at, at the end. Um, and there can't be really any dispute about it. That has to be set in stone because you can't have an owner coming back after you. Well, I think you know when we started out, I really had more value in there. So that's part of where the documentation comes in and really do documenting your deal. Um, and, you know, I, I am a real estate attorney. I do document all of our deals. Um, and I don't know, I've got a napkin, but I've gotten close. <laughs> I've gotten close to a napkin. Um, and a little tip, a little bit of advice for, for dealing with attorneys um, on this in terms of what your deal is. Honestly, if you just sit down and like, you know, get your calculator out and work your numbers, but then you also work through thinking about the deal flow and what your intent is. And I know this sounds super simple, but believe me, people don't do this. And you get all kinds of strange arrangements that, that don't make any sense. So help your attorney out and save yourself some money by just, just sitting down and actually thoroughly writing out. It, it's not, here's parties, here's what we're gonna do, they're going to invest. This is the labor. Here's our contractors. Here's what our expectations are, and just just go through that, and and that'll save you a ton of money. So, yeah, if I can add something to that, because I, I'll tell you, one of the biggest things when you're doing partnerships with especially sellers involved is is you don't want to do it with all sellers, and that there's some sellers out there that you're just you're waiting for the lawsuit to happen, and so you want to make sure that it's someone that seems reasonable up front. And it's like, just like Carol said, it's, it's you outline everything. And I highly suggest that if you haven't done one yet, that when you do, you involve someone who has at least more experience, I mean, not all of the experience, but more experience, and has done one, only in that there's so many different scenarios that can arise that you know your biggest risk is generally what you don't know. And so having an attorney or having someone who's got a lot of experience with that helps kind of breeze through all that. I think that's extremely important, especially for the communication up front, you know, with, with the homeowners or even when you're raising capital on a deal with an investor. Um, we had an investor one time that yelled at us because he got his money back. <laughs> <laughs> he got paid off, he signed the trustee release to release the prop loan from the property. The escrow sent him the money back and he called the closing agent saying, I need to have my money reinvested immediately. And I'm freaking out and he's calling and screaming at the closing agent. I'm like, what? Now it's not going to be invested at all. You know, you just, it's, just because you can do business with somebody doesn't mean you shouldn't. I think you know Robert's right and Carol's right with regard to the paperwork involved. You know, making sure that's outlined and clear up front, and you kind of gauge the craziness of the person you're dealing with, because there's some crazy people out there, and especially when you're talking about dealing with money. So when and, 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 you know, my brother used to work as a teller. He just shook his head like in college, was like. Ridiculous. People are nuts. 
Like, it's crazy. So, like, be careful when there's emotion involved in those situations whenever there's money involved. So, having that correct outline and that correct understanding up front is key. And having standard template documents that you can do, understanding the full scope of what you plan on doing in the future, will save you a ton of money as well when you're structuring these deals. Yeah, also, we used to always say, you know, it's like one in five people is really crazy, so look around. <laughs> trying to raise capital for their for a deal or, or just line up capital for their deals in the future. So by the way, it should always be everyone in the room. <laughs> <laughs> if you're con you should be constantly looking for, for capital and if you have capital you should be constantly looking for cheaper capital. So because that bottom line number when you're doing a lot of deals consistently is substantial. You know, it really adds up. I mean I don't know if it's one less point or one less you know, interest rate amount, you know, it's add up substantially. So, you know, constantly getting out there and developing your relationship base with investors is key, but then you've got to deal with sophisticated and non-sophisticated investors. Um, what are some of the things you've dealt with, uh, Robert, on some of the investor side issues that have come up when you're raising capital for private investors and things like that? I know you, you have larger lines of credit, larger, you know, sources now, but, you know, what do you see people go through? You, you know, the, you're, I remember firing some investors, you know, and because you do have some investors that are just very difficult to work with. Uh, I remember one in particular that the docs had to be perfect. If you were missing a comma somewhere, he wanted all those docs to be redone. And, you know, we end up, you know, you work with those guys when you absolutely have to, right? And then as soon as you raise other capital, they're the first to go. And they don't realize that they're actually costing themselves money because they lose out on more deals. You know, um, it, it's, but you do get some weird setups. I mean, we were very fortunate in like 2008 when the market crashed. Um, at the time, our fund was still positive, and, and so we were, I think, the only like hard money lender that that still ended up with a positive return, where everyone else was, you know, minus 15, minus 30 percent, or minus. I heard some stories as high as 80 or 90 percent off. And so, um, you know, we we really kind of worked very diligently to not just forecast but also understand the market and the needs of our clients so that we can kind of bridge that gap and, and fortunately work out for us. Um, but very easily it could have gone the other way. So we were fortunate that we had no lawsuits that came from that time, which I, I think you know it could have happened, but it didn't come without you know working I mean very, very hard and diligent for probably 18 months to work through you know the the a lot of the foreclosures that we took back and, and uh, really make sure that we had the fiduciaries that we had in place for our investors. Um, you know, some of the weird stories that I think came up is like, you know, I use my mom as an example. She she uh, invested some of her retirement money and, and uh, um, she used to do trustees and then stopped and and then uh, she told me it was like two years ago, you know, well, you know, I'm, I've got to open up the C D now or, or a new C D if they want me to do it. I'm like, why aren't you still doing trustees? She's like, well you haven't been doing them anymore. And I said, oh well all right, I said, well, you know, why don't you come in as like a second behind Mars and I'll give you 20%. And, and she's like, great, okay, sounds great. I pay her off and then she tells me, no, 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 that's too much money. It's too risky. And I said, listen, mom, the risk is over when you're getting your money back. I <laughs> understand <laughs> how this actually works. And she actually gave me like half of the money back. And, and, and so I still, I, I, well, actually, I don't even have to check with me, but I used to carry it around with me. Because it's like I've never catch it. Because I'm like, right, good luck. <laughs> but see, that's that's exactly what I'm talking about. Though there's completely different levels of sophistication when it comes to these investors, and some of them, and if you're if you're not teaching them right up front when you're raising capital, you're going to find out that you're going to have some crazy people or people that didn't understand the situation that are crazy. You know, that just just don't, don't know about investments and how the collateral works or what happens when there is a downturn or an issue. You know, what do they do and what are their rights and, and how yeah. do they protect you? The, the, other, the other big thing that we had a lot when we were raising capital is that we were raising capital and at the time, you know, we were offering like nine, ten percent. And the amount of people that thought the risk was too great that would take the exact same investment at six and seven percent was amazing. Right? Same deal, same deal of trust, we made more money. <laughs> awesome. 
it's perception. It's too, it's too, just like my mom, it's too risky at 20%. The risk is over, right? <laughs> you got your money <coughs> money. So that, that's what happened. You have to understand, and this is a lot of just really understanding who either your investor is and what their needs are. If they're in growth state, they're looking for more returns. If they're in, you know, just kind of hungry down and get a return, and it's and they're and they're they're, they're if you offer them fifteen percent versus seven percent, it's probably hurting yourself versus versus uh, helping them. Yeah, and you're now talking about that making sure you properly explain the money. Usually, when you're fundraising, you're fundraising to a deadline, right? There's an escrow close day. Something's happening where you have to raise money in a certain period of time. It's real easy to kind of be. Um, loose with the information you, just because you need the money to try and close and that's where you get yourself in a situation where you may close it's after the fact that you realize wait a minute they didn't really understand what we were talking about they didn't necessarily understand the paperwork that we were going through and then all of a sudden there's a problem and now you're in the deal and those are a lot harder to unravel once that scroll has closed instead of maybe you know what i don't know if you're the right person for this and moving on and finding other um, so, uh, speaking of you know uh, um, self-directed IRAs in particular, um, you know, there's so many different ways of, of people either using their self-directed IRA to fund deals or using their self-directed IRA to fund other people's deals right. as lenders. So, right. kind of talk about a little bit of what what that looks like from yeah. the individual IRA holders' perspective. I, I really like to. I think because you know we're talking about like you're talking about investing with your own cash and. And when I'm talking about investing with retirement dollars, well, these are obviously precious dollars, as I mentioned, but when you're raising capital, you're raising capital from a pool of, guess what, $27 trillion in America that's in retirement money, and only like 3% of that is invested in what's called alternative assets, meaning housing, like house, a house, an alternative asset, but it is, okay? Or non-correlated assets, not correlated to the stock market. So, so this is the, the question that you ask when you're raising capital and you want to use self-directed IRA money. You say to them, do you have an IRA or a 401k with a previous employer? And they say yes, and you go, great, because did you know you can take that money and invest with it? Like, what? I didn't know you can't. No, the stock market, you can only invest in mutual funds or you know, the, with the IRAs are just for, just for mutual funds. So it's, it's a common misperception, but I'll tell you what, you've been able to self-direct for 43 years now since the, uh, who was alive when Gerald Ford was president besides me? <laughs> right? Okay. So that's how long ago it was. Gerald Ford, you know, <laughs> you know yeah. he signed the ERISA laws into effect in 74. They went to effect in 1975. Who wasn't born in 1975? Just love to know. Okay. Oh my gosh. We love you. Love you so much. So for, for, for some of the people in this room, for your entire life, you've been in a self directed IRA. I love like that. But it's like a best kept secret. You know, it's like a best kept secret. So you tell your, your investor, hey, do you have an IRA or do you have a 401k with the previous employer? And they don't know anything about it. So you're like, you're opening their eyes to this new possibility. And you'll, you'll hear people speak negatively about investing in real estate with a self-directed IRA because there are rules and restrictions and you need you absolutely like any investment need to know what you're doing upfront, right? And that's, that's true, so if, if the question is, um, and do you as a tax person get this, if I have a bunch of money in my checking account, a bunch of money in my retirement account, and, I've got, and I want to get this property, which one's better? And Matt, you're going to probably say, use your personal money, right? Because you might get the best tax results, or the, best, the most write-offs. That could be the case. But the, there's a different question. If the question is, I don't have a bunch of money in my checking account, but I just, I used to work at Boeing and now I've got half a million in my 401k. Now the question is, do I put that in the stock market or do I put it in real estate or some other asset class that I understand? That's a different question. And so if, you're, if that's the question and you choose real estate, that's what a self-directed IRA is for. It's a vehicle, just like a, we're kind of like, not exactly, but kind of like escrow. So you know, like you, you bring a deal to escrow, well escrow doesn't tell you if it's a good or a bad deal. And they don't tell you whether you should or shouldn't do it, or, or oh, my friend has a different property, why don't you buy this house over here? They don't tell you what house to buy. They're simply following your instructions. Hi, I wanna buy, buy this house, and they take the paperwork from where it is now, move it on through till it's now closed and funded and it's your property, or something like that. I mean, a, a different, not, it, it's a pretty close analogy. We're, we're not 
you know, changing title or anything like that, but we're administering it. Taking the money from where it is in your in your retirement life, in your in your account, moving it forward to a self-directed IRA, and then put in investing those assets as you direct. That's why I, the company's name of that. <laughs> investing the assets into the assets that you choose. So we just sent the money over here. A hundred percent of the proceeds have to go back in the IRA that owns the asset. And this can blow some people's minds, but a hundred percent, yes, of the expenses have to be paid for by that IRA. So you know what we've We've had, we've had people buy um, their own properties with their IRAs, and here comes the rent check, and they just put it right in their own pocket. And so this guy called us and told us he did this, and we said, what? You know, he says, well, I, I claimed it as income on my income taxes. That's okay, right? So that's called taking constructive use of your IRA, and that means, so when you commit a prohibited transaction, that means your IRA is not an IRA anymore. It's like you just earned that income. So that's so that, that's game over. So a prohibited transaction is game over. Maybe we'll talk about it later tonight. But that's why when you call us, we're gonna say, hey, you know, what's your name? How do we get a hold of you? And how'd you hear about us? But we really want to talk to you. We'll go in depth as long as it takes. Tell us about your deal. Who are you investing with? What's your deal? What's the structure? And we want to hear this before you open an account. Because we don't want you to open and fund an account and then find out that you can't do your deal because it's a prohibited transaction. You see, so there are rules, so we'll get into that more, but but there you go. So, so we give you an opportunity to tap into that. I just got back from DC, you know, so we got the new number. Yeah. I remember when we started this 10 years ago, it was like 18 trillion. Now it's $27 trillion in America in retirement. It's like IRAs and 401ks and pensions and so forth. So that's what we help you do. And it's one of the biggest funding sources that you can utilize and also utilize for your own investing. Um, you know, there's so many different things you can do inside your own, you know, 401k or IRA um, that can work. And you want your juiciest deals inside those types of accounts if you can to try to use that for retirement to get that high enough to where you can use it to, to cash flow off of for retirement. To retire. So, um, uh, we have a question here? Yeah. Question? Yes. But do you, I know everyone probably hates Bitcoin right now, but do you have funds set up to invest in cryptocurrency? That's a really good question. I mentioned it was just in DC, and we had a whole like a breakout session about this. Um, I'll, let, I'll repeat the question. The question is, essentially, can she invest her IRA in cryptocurrency, right? Yeah, I mean, I know certain companies have setups for that, but I just don't know which ones, or if there are restrictions or regulations that are currently putting in place. Right, so, so are there regulations about Bitcoins and self-directed IRAs? So we talked about this, right? So all these, People in this group, they're all, they own trust companies or they're like, they're like you direct or, and, uh, and we're all in this room together. So there are really two ways to do it. One is to take an IRA owned LLC. That's where your IRA opens a special purpose LLC. And just, that's essentially, uh, we, we can go deep on it, but that's, we'll just leave it right there. And then LLC invest, opens a wallet invest in cryptocurrency. But there are other uh, companies that will have um, cold storage, you right? Of this cryptocurrency, well, so one of the guys was saying, one of the trust company owners was saying that he bought one of these little devices for cold storage, and he realized the incredible amount of liability that he had, because if you get these these codes like off by one digit, you can lose someone's money, yeah. and it will never be found. It's in the blockchain; you will never retrieve it. So, and he and he also did like having this cold storage. It's a device that's like about the size of this microphone, and what if uh, there was fire? And could he get insurance? Does he have insurance covering if there is such a loss? Human error. Do humans make mistakes? No, they never do. Okay. <laughs> so before I would invest my retirement dollars in cryptocurrency and somebody that's gonna keep it in cold storage, I wanna say, let me see your insurance policy. Because if there's a human error, what are you gonna do about it? That would, that's what I would ask. But if you're doing it with an IRA or an LLC, it's you, and the cryptocurrency wallet. You know, what are, what are they, Kryptonite is one of them, and there's Coinbase, and there, there are, I think, like, so many different kinds of, of, of uh, these uh, wallets that you can invest in, and it's just growing. And it's it, it's a big point of contention with the SEC, they're trying to monitor it, and, you know, look for fraud. So, can you do it? Yes, is that a long answer? Yes. Um, so it's either cold storage or an IRA, using the LLC to invest in a, well, and you're talking about, I'm not sure what cold storage is, but what I'm talking about is day trading. It's not really long-term hold, but actually you're, you're doing stuff every day. That's what you're talking about. 
Yeah, I think, like, I have one of those accounts on my cell phone, right? It's called Coinbase. Because I thought, well, I want to understand it. By the way, there's a really great uh, thing on Netflix. If you just put Bitcoin in your Netflix thing, there's a great um, uh, good documentary on this. And by the way, the day it came out, Bitcoin spiked. Yeah. That was the, it correlates with the spike. But if you don't understand Bitcoin and what it is, and cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, do yourself a favor and, and look into that. So when you're talking about day trading, I mean that's when you're using that's when you're using a wallet when you can do those those, those trades real quick. And so again, if I that, that's if somebody wants to invest in cryptocurrency with us, they use the IRA owned LLC. You as the managing member are opening a, a wallet in the name of the IRA because it's an IRA owned asset, and so you have to title it correctly. And then and there you go. So it, it's it's I'll tell you it's a new frontier and it's. There's, we've got a lot to learn. There's a lot of learning to do about cryptocurrency, about how it all works. So it's early days on that asset class. And I think it's important to understand too that like if you're if you're going through and doing the, the cryptocurrency and you're doing day trading, it could be construed as running a business inside your own retirement account, in which case it's subject to unrelated business income tax, which is pretty high. It's like what forty percent or fifty percent, I think, right now. Um, yeah, I don't pay it, so I don't pay it. But yeah, I don't run a business inside my own IRA. So uh, what's the what's the what's the tax rate right now on us? Uh, uh, it just hurts me to say it. I don't know it's if I like say it. Fifty percent or something. I don't want to hurt you. No, it, it's it's the same rate as the trust rate, which I believe just changed. I think it's thirty eight percent, right? Okay. Yeah. So it's thirty eight percent. But but okay. But uh, let's let's go back a little bit. And you're the CPA, so you correct me. But if your IRA owns this, this tax, you get to actually take deductions. So if your IRA is going to pay this tax, it's going to file a form 990T. Like you and I, we do a 1040 when we do our taxes. If an IRA does own tax, it files a 990T. So you talk to your tax advisor, and they're going to take deductions off of it. So maybe maybe this isn't the worst thing that ever happened if you've got expenses to offset the tax, right? So you just want to pencil it out. It's not the end of the world, but just pencil it out and see after this tax doesn't make sense for you. Uh, I think it's important to really understand self-directed retirement accounts for that capital raise component. Um, just like, just as much as it's important to understand, you know, the paperwork behind it, uh, a deal, and so um, and, and how to structure it correctly so that you can explain it to your investors. And I think um, most people get the wrong information about this. And Carol, can you kind of, you know, probably one of the simplest ways to raise capital is through the form of a promissory note or a joint venture or something like that. Um, what are your thoughts as far as can you, can you kind of explain to people what typically goes into the paperwork on a promissory note? If you were if a borrower uh, came to you or a lender came to you and wanted you to help them understand what are the major documents involved and how do they get protected, can you kind of explain that so that everybody here kind of understands it? Yeah, sure. So, well, Karen gave a great explanation of a promissory note previously, and you have to have the, uh, uh, the amount the date, the repayment, um, you know, uh, what the interest rate is, and um, you have to identify the parties, and then promissory notes that, that we do on, on our deals, um, if we usually have a, we've done it a couple different ways. One of the ways that, that is a very simple way to do it is, let's say you go to a hard money lender and they, uh, you have to um, uh, then sign a promissory note to the hard money lender and they take a security interest in a first position on the property you're buying. And then maybe you have additional investors who are gonna help you to um, fund the balance of the transaction, which would be your basically your, your construction budget and your down payment and contingencies and everything else. So what we've done is we've taken our pool of in investors, or maybe at times it's been one investor, and they also get a promissory, they, they get a promissory note where we promise to pay them the money back, and then secured, again, with a second against the property. So then the, the project goes through, the renovation goes through, and then the property is sold, and both parties are, are paid off. Um, so that's that's just one of the simplest forms. If you're going to do separate pool of investors and maybe a hard money lender, or maybe um, I don't know, maybe you, uh, have not a hard money lender, maybe somebody has funds that uh, will do it for a lower interest rate for you, um, another friend's family, and then you have a pool. But that's that's kind of one of the simplest ways we do it. 
When, when does an investment become a syndication versus uh, I told you I was going to ask that question. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a securities uh, attorney, but um, really when it's not a straight note and there is a um, there is a kicker on it. It really, really is a security um, because it's not just a promise to pay at a certain stated rate. What you're doing is you're promising to pay at a stated rate plus a bonus at the end, and that bonus fluctuates um, based on what your what your deal is and how good the deal turns out. And so that's that is a risk, and it is considered a security. So if you're going to put a kicker on it, then you might want to talk to a securities attorney um, where you set up a, what's called a private placement memorandum. So the documents that you would have in that deal, instead of just a simple note and a deed of trust that secures the lien against the property, what you have is a prospectus for your deal, and then you also have a private placement memorandum, which is a comprehensive document which really lays out what the deal is, who the parties are, what your history is um, in terms of transactions, how the deal is going to be structured, how the payoffs are going to be, what the length of time, can you get out, um, when, how long is your money committed. And so that private placement memorandum uh, is something the investors will look at. But what's key here is that um, there's uh, qualified and accredited investors, and there are non-qualified. So accreditors and investors that will um, are able to invest in a deal under a private placement memorandum that, that is exempt from securities regulations, like doesn't have to go through all the, the bells and whistles and hoops to be registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is that, that's what public companies do, and that's outrageously expensive, and you never do that in one of these deals, unless you're a huge company. Um, but if you have to, you have to qualify your investors. So if you're out there raising, com uh, raising money, and you're doing a private placement memorandum, because you're giving a percentage, you're giving a profit to these investors, um, then the rule is that your investor has to have at least a million dollars worth of assets other than their personal residence, and they have to earn more than 200,000 individually and three as a married couple. And so many people will go to an attorney, securities attorney, they'll develop the paperwork, and then the attorney can also do the, um, the accreditation for you. So, so that it's an independent third party that is going through the prospective investors financials so that you as the the, the the operator and the of the of the investment doesn't doesn't have to do that I, I that's a little more comfortable so another layer there so um, so those are accredited non-accredited or you can do I you know I also don't I don't do crowdfunding but you know there that's another way to you know invest if you have a deal and um, you have a history and you can prove that you have knowledge in the industry and that you have a track record, you can go to one of these sites and, and have them vet your deal and then your deal is put on their, their websites and people can invest as little as five or $10,000, um, which is a great deal. Uh, I've never done one of those. I'm, I'm thinking about it, but I've never done one. It's a, it can be expensive depending on who you're going to. So, and, and, yeah. and a lot of times now they put you on a platform and don't do necessarily any marketing or they can leave it up to you. There's a lot of service-based uh, platforms now, uh, which is really interesting. Um, but a, a lot of those, you know, they'll raise money off of the capital raise as well. Um, which I just seem to be a little bit more expensive than traditional, um, just because you're dealing with more professional investors and the and the um, crowdfunder needs to make a spread too. You know, so yeah. Also, I mean, the crowdfunders for if you're looking at basic flips are really, I think, uh, in large part, really cost prohibitive. And you might as well just go to a hard money lender that's going to give you a yes or no versus a. I mean, I think most of the crowdfunders that are in the hard money business are really glorified hard money lenders, right? And they're using the term crowdfunding because it's fancy and you and people think it's sexy or what have you. Really, they're just a hard money lender. 
And you know, you'd be better sort of going to a hard money lender and knowing right up front if your deal's gonna happen versus, I mean, just think about it. You're putting out deposits, you're doing all this, you're making commitments on maybe the crowd is gonna fund your deal. All right, you're better off having someone who says, yeah, we're, let's do that deal, let's go. And, and that works a little bit. I think, I think the, the single family home flip space is not where you go for no. crowdfunding money. Or you go, yeah, you go there, yeah, you go there for large commercial deals and things like that, or stuff that you may not be able to raise se separately, you know, yourself. Yeah, this is, this is, I'm not going to be going on those sites. Just I'm just being curious about doing one of our deals, and and there there are a lot of residential flips there, which which amazes me. Yeah, a lot. I mean, just wading through that as an investor, I can I just can't imagine having five thousand dollars and spending days like plowing through all that stuff online. I would going back to people and investing instead of spending my five thousand dollars plowing through all that and and going to a, a kind of this anonymous crowdfunding site, I, I would rather kind of pool my resources and and pull together my money and go to organizations like this and really get to know people and know who you're dealing with and then invest in a single up deal. Um, yeah, there, there's a rule in investing, right? You're never supposed to be the first investor in it. Right, you're supposed to let someone else take all that risk and learn the curve and all that good stuff and let somebody else pay for that education and then come in and make all the money. In some sort of, in IRAs, where we, see, we see a lot of different um, ways of, of investing. So I think just to kind of like recap what everyone's saying, you can invest it as a note with it as being a vehicle or a private placement, and the private placements come in a reg A, reg B, reg C, which is crowdfunding, and reg D, which is we see the most commonly. So that, that that's a Securities and Exchange Commission governs that and FINRA governs these, these offerings. So if you're going to invest in something, you can do it as a note where it's a debt. You're going to get your, you've got your IRA as a debt position, in my case it's your IRA. Or you can invest in like this reg, reg A, B, C, or D where your IRA has an equity position or, or could be debt. Yeah, you know, really, uh, the, de the debt structure is the easiest way to raise money. If, you're just get, if you just have an investor and you either have, let's call it an A and a B piece, and your A piece might be a hard money loan or an investor like myself, and a B piece might be a secondary investor for that gap. Or like, I mean, there's gap lenders that do that as well. And, you know, that's the easiest structure for most transactions before you get into something that's much more sophisticated, like a syndication. Syndications that I found that work well for apartment buildings um, in that, you know, generally there might not be a set rate of return. And the, all the income, the resale at a set time, all of that goes into their return. So the, you have the expectation of a return, but one of the first things in the syndication that says is you can lose some or all of your money, right? So if you, you, know, if you don't understand that and you don't have a lot of money to invest, and that's literally the first line that is in bold print before you even turn the page, you know, you're gonna think twice about it. And so if you're just starting out in you know, a single family space or development space, you know, there's a lot of other vehicles to use. Uh, one of my favorites, I think, would be probably just if you have enough funds to have closed the deal already, that you securitize a note for your own money, you know, from a different entity on that, and then try to sell that note, and you'll meet a bunch of investors, you know, because because even if they tell you you're crazy or I want to buy your hundred thousand dollar note for ten thousand dollars, it doesn't matter. You're meeting more people with money, so it's just you know, and then build up your database from investors from that standpoint. You know, so there's, there's sites that are out there that are very good. What, what other ways do you think? I mean, uh, networking has always worked for me. You know, raising capital. <laughs> well, what, are, what are some other ways? Um, you know, that's a great strategy for raising capital. Are there any strategic ways you could market for capital and things like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, and that. So marketing for capital is tricky, right? Because you're not supposed to have to market for capital once you have some capital to sell, like a, like a note. And, and there's, I know the rules have changed, especially since I've gotten out of the business, um, you know, the Jobs Act and everything. And, and uh, but from just a, a simplistic form, you know, if you have a note to sell and you put it on a site that just sells notes, you're going to meet people that are already interested in investing in real estate, right? So that's the easy, low-hanging fruit. Rather than try to convince someone who is in, you know, a doctor and trying to convince them that real estate is a great investment and their parents lost their house in 2008 or something, right? So 
the other thing is, is sellers, by the way, are a fantastic source. Of the, you know, there's a lot of sellers that sell. They just had a good experience with real estate because they cashed out all of their money. And sometimes they are now accredited investors if you have a fund, or just might be someone that you meet. And it's the same way if you market a note for sale. It's kind of the loophole that you're selling a you know, tangible asset that you're selling versus just asking them for money for, for no reason. Now, they don't have to buy that note, right? If they don't buy that note, hey, we have other things that are coming up, and then that kind of opens the door a little bit. Well, one strategy I heard about recently that I thought was brilliant was to actually go to, if you're trying to raise capital in a certain market or something like that for your deals, and you're focusing on a certain farm area, to literally go through and pull the data reports from title companies for all of the, the uh, private lenders that are on reported against properties specifically and pull that, pull all the mortgage holders and get rid of all the banks and the bigger companies there and just start marketing with direct mail and, and, and things like that to those specific uh, uh, to those specific lenders that they want to buy the note or if they have other capital they want to invest. And I know a lot of people are getting cheap financing that way. So if you do that, a, a big recommendation is once you put it on a spreadsheet, is organize it by mailing address. And because a lot of these mortgage companies, right, they'll, they'll go straight, the mail goes straight back to them. So if you then, you see, you know, one address has 200 notes, and they're all individual different names, they don't share a house, it's a company that says all the mail coming back to them, save your mail, save your postage, and just eliminate all of those. Yeah, it's, that, you know, you can get tons of lists, but weeding through the list for what specifically you want to market for um, can be, I mean, it's the most important thing. You, you have to, you have no business marketing for this unless you can track specifically your data because you're just wasting money if you're not tracking correctly. So that can be huge. Yeah, and one of the things is, if, if, I mean, I'm, I don't know, can I just ask, how many of you guys have already done a transaction? Okay, great, that's, that's most of the room, so that's fantastic. Because if you haven't, partner with someone around here and do a transaction because the first, I guarantee you one of the first questions that an investor is going to ask you is, how many of these have you done? And you say, well, you know, this, and you dance around. The question was never answered and you think you did well? All he hears is bullshit. <laughs> and so, sorry, sorry. <laughs> but all he hears is just, you know, that you don't know what you're doing. And you want to be able to show, it's like, hey, here's the deals that I've done, here's this, here's my experience, or, you know, I don't, but I have a partner that's doing this. and get that experience under your belt so that you can, you know, not just answer that question, but also so that you can have and, and hold your fiduciary to that person in high regard, right? Because ultimately, if you're, I mean, I always treated everyone's money like it's, it's my own. And if, if, it's, if you can't do that, then the problem is that, you know, you might look at a deal biased because, hey, you just need to do another deal. And I'll tell you, the biggest part of investing is walking away from a deal that you think it might be good, but it might not be. And the ones that have a question mark, you don't gamble on when you're using someone else's money. It, it, you have to feel, I mean, there's already a question mark because of the economy and everything else on every deal at any given day. If you can't feel 100% confident that this is quote unquote a no brainer and you're using other people's money, you probably should really think about how you're looking at other people's money. Carrie, you talked about um, putting together a prospectus for a, a PPM, but I think just in general, anytime you're out trying to raise capital, you want to put together information that you can share with someone who might be interested in. Can you talk about what makes for a good prospectus or just a block of information that if you're going to share a deal with someone and see if they're interested? What are some of the good components of what that looks like? I think that I think the components are, are the same. I mean, you want to that that are in a, one of the more comprehensive, um, you know, private placement memorandums. But it, you just do it in a briefer, a more brief uh, uh, manner, and that everybody wants to know the parties, and they have to know what the subject of the investment is, whether it's a, whether it's an investing in a note or whether it's going to be a particular property that is going to be. Um, either held for uh, long-term investment purposes with a group of, of people or it's going to be a flip. Obviously, the subject has to be there. You have to um, provide the terms, what the expectation of a return. Of course, a lot of you know disclaimers about that this don't always work out well. Um, and then you have to have the data to back it up. Um, because especially with flipping homes, one of the most critical things is 
do you really understand your numbers and you, can you clearly talk about the numbers with your potential investors and demonstrate that uh, you have an understanding of the marketplace, what it's going to cost, what your experience is with the, the contractor. Um, when, I, when I'm reviewing a deal, one of my, um, ugh, I had a scout come to me um, about it, two years ago and um, recently divorced, had a, a nice settlement, um, and um, she had a million dollars and she wanted to plunk it all in one deal. And uh, so we had a lot of long talks about this. <laughs> I love the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're probably out there drooling, thinking, why can't I have those? That, that, that is both a dream client and a nightmare client all the same time. <laughs> and, well, and, and what was, and I have another one like, kind of like that too. Um, uh, yeah, she's pregnant. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the difficulty in, in this deal is the things I, I looked at, I mean, the, the Operator had done this. Um, it was in a certain. They were they were doing a certain type of, of, of deal that they've done multiple times before. Definitely, the history was there. Um, they uh, she vetted the the prior deals and actually interviewed prior investors, and so that was good. Um, and um, was very determined to do this deal, despite my suggestion that maybe she ought to spread it around a little bit. Um, but very determined to do this. Um, and so then we got down to um, that, and that was kind of in the, 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 just the perspective about the deal, just the deal points, what he'd done, what his history is. We researched uh, the, the operator to find out if he really was who he said he was. Um, and like I said, she interviewed people. Uh, and then we got down to um, what, the way he structured it was he did an LLC for this particular project. She was investing, they were also gonna get a loan. Um, she had a, a preferential um, uh, a payment at the end to get her money back and, and a preference. Um, but what bothered me about his his operating agreement is he created this LLC. They were gonna be, his, his other LLC and her other LLC were gonna be the only two members, so it's just the two entities in this LLC. But there was a lot of things in that agreement that, that bothered me. As an example, he, he did a lot of these deals, right? So one of the provisions was that if he wanted to sell out his interest or, or um, to somebody else, he could do that. And then he got to sell and he got to pick his replacement manager. And I'm like, uh -uh, no. Um, you can't have all your money in a deal and the exiting partner um, picking who's going to run the project from here on in. So it was there was some things like that that I really and he was getting kind of testy with me, the, the operator, because I wanted to change his his um, LLC agreement. Part of it was he didn't want to, it, it, you know, I'm an attorney, I'm a pain, right? Okay, I get that. Um, but the but the other thing was his he wanted to close escrow, so he was getting he was getting. The, the, the tighter it got and the closer it got to close the escrow, he's getting a little tense. But that was the, the bigger, biggest one. Really reading through the operating agreement or preparing an operating agreement that um, is, is fair to the parties is, is something that you taking in money are going to have to consider. Um, and that's part of that list is I'm going to circle back to what I was saying before. What I said before is thinking through the deal okay, I'm taking this money in, it's somebody else's money, what am I gonna pay him, what's the timeline, and what happens if things go wrong, are they gonna get their money back, are they gonna get anybody back, are they gonna potentially lose it all, what happens if something happens to me, and I'm the operator who takes over, do I have um, somebody in place in mind to be able to run the project if I'm not running it, um, disclosing who you're, what your budgeting is, your contractors, what your relationships are. I mean, those are all important. If you're, if you're taking people's money, they need to understand that you've thought through this and have, have touched all the points on good times and definitely on bad times if, if it doesn't work out. And that's, that's what's in that agreement. And that's called due diligence. Yeah. See, that operator, I, I looked at, an, an operator who would take someone's everything Right, is doing just a, that's where fiduciary comes in, right? 
you should never put someone in that position because if something does go wrong and there's a cash call, you know, then he needs more money. That investor also has to come up with more money. So to not leave them in that position, I mean, just that, that's, that's terrible. The fact that someone that's, would do that to start. Yes. That's, that's one of the other, that's, that's one of the other things I, I changed is he also had a provision in there about um, uh, cash calls and, and we, um, put a provision in there to to cap it, and we had to look for other sources of funds, and you know, it was a bunch of stuff like that. So it's happening. <laughs> so I think it's it's important. Like if you're trying to put together information for investors, right? You may have someone like Carol on the other side reading the deal because if they are a sophisticated investor and they have an attorney, your 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 documents are going to have to pass muster. I'd say it's one of the biggest things that when we're looking at deals. If the docs are trash, chances are they're not a quality <laughs> operator. It's a huge red flag. So, and if they're getting emotional with you on that stuff from the oh, start, that's, yeah, it, that's it, always a red flag. Right? Yeah, when, when you start pushing back and asking questions, and they start all of a sudden wanting and to close, angry. and they're pushing and they're getting upset, yeah. that's a red flag. What is it? There's like seven or thirteen things that you can't say in a in a in a, in a, in a PPM, right? One of them is like guarantee. Yeah. You know. You know, value that like you can't just say this is the value, especially when you're talking about you know an after repair value. Yeah. How do you know what the after repair value is going to be? It's really the market's going to tell So you have to have a third party that things like. I mean, it's just it's 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 much more difficult to do than just to know people with money. Question. Uh, this might be a bit of a new question, but um, so when you're out and raising raising capital, uh, I guess before you do that, uh, you know, I'm kind of thinking about. Corporate. Sometimes you know, like sellers and buyers to get exclusivity with buyers with the buyer company. Um, is there is that something that's going over board like getting exclusivity and getting close? Because I'm thinking like would it, would it be possible that the investor could come in and you just overtake the deal and the opportunity from your hands or at that point are you already exclusive with it? So I, I, I can understand the question. But I think the question is, is there if when you have a potential investor um, is there a way to lock them in so that they can't go around you to that transaction yeah. and kick you out of it? Is there a specific agreement? That yeah, there, I mean, there's, there's non-circumvent agreements, uh, yeah. non-disclosures. You know, there's certainly a, a big part to just your gut feeling about someone because a, a, you know, a signature means absolutely nothing unless you're willing to fight for that signature and it's right. And so you have to be willing to sue them, right? To, and, and there's a lot of people that would just sign anything because they don't care. Because, so someone that has that doesn't have the moral turpitude to to, to to care that they're signing something is probably not someone you want to do the you know the business with anyhow. And, and that's a lot of it just comes from experience and just a gut feeling that you might have. And, but you do have to be prepared to go after them if you're going to. And if it's if it's a smaller deal, you're probably not going to go after them because you're not going to spend fifty thousand to go after them. And, and, you know. To, to get your third. So when you present to investors, I guess when you maybe like start off with an anonymous teaser that kind of reveal the property name, and then kind of like maybe things get serious and that data in the game. No, I, I, I mean, I'll tell you, if someone wasn't willing to give me the information as an investor, I wouldn't even waste my time with it. Because it's, it's just, it's, it's it, part of it is a business decision from your standpoint, right? You have to gamble a little bit and be willing to lose some deals to know who not to work with. And at the same time, you know, I mean, spread the word until that happens because, you know, there, there's plenty of people on Facebook that I, I see putting other investors on blast or real estate agents on blast because they did something. They didn't get paid or they, you know, wasn't as promised, you know, and that, and it's a small world, I'll tell you. I mean, it's, it's a very, as big as this business is, it's a very small community. You know, if you look at the, especially investors, right? The investor side, you know, I mean, cash transactions only count for a very small proportion of all the transactions. So chances are that gets around. And if you ask your peers in the business, someone may have had a bad experience with someone already. Yeah, I'd also say, we'll get a couple questions here, is make sure you got the deal locked up before you start talking to other people. You know, so you don't want to have a deal where you've got a handshake agreement or a verbal agreement with someone, and then you go out and start talking, and now you're concerned about them going around you. Make sure you've got the deal locked up under contract, so even if they do try to get around you, they're not going to be able to take it. Yeah, 
in, in the commercial world, I'll tell you, if, you know, there's wholesalers in the residential world, happens every day. And it's very common, and there's a common courtesy amongst investors with wholesalers that like, listen, if we're making the money, we don't care, just make your money. In the commercial world, they just straight ask us, like, what do I need you for? And they will just, just they'll tell you your face, which is, you know, uh, not just refreshing, but it's also, they're gonna tell you, we don't need you. You don't have the money to close. We know you don't have the money to close this deal. So why don't I just wait you out and then buy the deal? Then what? They're right. You know, I mean, they're not wrong. The difference in the residential world is you have a hundred other guys that might buy it. In the commercial world, you might have half a dozen, and they know each other. <laughs> so, being, being new to this, these operating contracts, so that the operators coming in not getting screwed on this deal by the shady investor who sees that, oh my God, he's got stuff written on a napkin. Like, where do we go about that? Do we, do we reach out to lawyers like, like yourself to, to find these operating contracts where it's fair to both parties? Yeah, let me, let me go back a little bit. Um, oh, uh, how do you, how do you, for the back row, the question is how do you um, structure a, a deal and, and at what point do you go to an attorney to, to structure a deal? Let, let's just, let me just back up and, and take I don't know what type of investments that everybody's interested in, but let's just say you're going to do a house flip, okay? So it's either brought to you by a wholesaler or a realtor, and so the, you put it under contract. So then you've got the, the property locked down so nobody can go around you because you have a contract with that seller, right? And you, but then you're kind of under the gun, if you will, unless you convince the seller to give you a you know four month escrow period or something like that, which is not likely in this market, right? So then so then you're looking at reaching out to those people you've talked to who are potential investors, right? So at, at the point where you have to make the decision or what you're how you're gonna do this, is it gonna be um, are you basically gonna hundred percent finance the deal, you're gonna go to hard money, then you're gonna have investors and they're gonna do a second on it. So it's just going to be a pure note. Are they going to participate with you? At that point, you are ultimately going to need an agreement between the investors and you. The hard money lenders pretty easily because they want a note in the deed of trust and they want it on the first position, and that's that's a no-brainer, right? It's how you gather the other investments to your deal and and how do you document it if they are a pool of investors. Uh, and it's going to be a note. You can do several people on one single note um, or a series of notes, but that's trickier if you have more than more than one party as a as a second. It, you can't. You have to pull the investors on on one secondary note. Otherwise, they'd be in second, third, fourth, fifth position, and nobody wants that, right? So you can do it as a straight note, or if you're going to have them participate, then you do need to have a contract with them. Um, that that is this participation agreement, um, and you may want to start and form an LLC to buy it, and then they can be um, members. They can they can be members that don't have voting power. I mean, so that is the point. You have to decide: is it going to be purely debt, or is it going to be they can have an equity position? And then what is your deal with them? And at some point, yeah, you do have to go. You go online or you go to an attorney, you think through that contract and oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, look, when you're starting out, if you don't want to spend thousands of dollars on an attorney, you're gonna gamble, right? That's the reality. Is you're gonna gamble on someone that you either meet and you get along with and you try to see, you know, try to vet the person as best as you can. Um, but the reality is you know, if it's a smaller deal it looks like we're gonna make thirty thousand you're not going to want to spend ten thousand dollars on the right contract, yeah. right? You're going to spend. You're, you're going to sit there and read it, and make sure it makes sense, and there may or may not be some legal stuff that you may or may not understand, and you're going to gamble on that for sale and see how it goes. And that's kind of, you know, if, if you don't have a lot of skin in the game and it's more sweat equity, you know, that might be easier to swallow than if you're also putting in a bunch of money into the deal. It depends on how big the deal is, and right? Like that. Of course, too, if you're stuck with a single family home, 
but it's probably probably better to just use dead initially, and then you know if you have a second position, try to use dead if you can on that because it's simple and clean. You know if you can, you have to bring a joint venture partner in, get an attorney to write you a joint venture contract. You know for that second that second position, you know just to have that in place. You know you don't have any legal liability protection with a joint venture contract, but you know at the same time, you know it's also for one flip it might not be prudent depending on how much profits involved to open an LLC, depending on how much how much you're trying to protect in your own assets, and there's a million different factors to determine if you should just get insurance for that deal or put it into an entity or how much profits on that deal, how big it is, you know, how much of a second you have to bring in or how much equity you have to bring in. You know, if you have to bring in multiple other investors involved, then you might want to, you're going to be opening an entity probably for sure, but then you have to deal with securities issues and things like that. So sometimes on the securities issues, when you're pooling investor money together, um, in order for it not to be a syndication, you need to make sure that they have some some uh, control or uh, ability to decision decision make, and that they actually do make those decisions too. Because if they don't, then then they could construe that they were passive the whole time. And so some of these types of things um, need to be outlined and understood before you go and start pooling money together for deals on bigger deals. But you know, I, I'd even say some of these things you need to get before you even go find the deal, yeah. right? So if that kind of structure is way too complicated, then you need to find smaller, simpler deals. I'd also say, I'll get back here, is that, um, you know, when you're dealing with, with that type of situation, especially when you're dealing with, with another investor, per se, um, that's a great opportunity to find someone who's got more experience than you, because they may have legal docs they've used in the past, at least you've got a starting point, right, versus trying to find something online starting from scratch. Um, other people's money, what a great idea. <laughs> Thank you all for sharing all this great information. I was just wondering though, um, w is there some place for somebody who is not familiar with all of this to see like a template of, of an agreement or the concept somewhere online or something like that? Just doing something to see what it is that to, yeah. You're talking about sample legal docs on different different kinds yeah, of Yeah, and like or description of them because yeah, I might not understand the legal docs. You, you know, I, I, I've looked um, just online, you, you just Google, you'll see all kinds of different ones that you can read through. And it's, you know, it's great reading right before What are you right Googling now? Like, what, I'm, I'm that dumb, I don't really understand what to look at. Um, so, so just her question first was, is there a place that, we can, that you could find, you know, templates for legal docs? Um, first Tuesday, I think that's a lot of them, right? Um, FirstTuesday.com. Um, they have a lot of legal zoom. That's, that's a bunch of like samples. Nolo, yeah, Nolo. You were telling me about someone who's got some online. Um, West, West Law. But what would you be? I, I know I'm familiar with some of those. But what exactly would you be looking for? In, I, what would you be looking for in, I, joint venture. Joint, joint, joint venture agreement, um, equity participation, um, shared appreciation loans. That type of that that really so shared appreciation loan is essentially a loan that has a what she said was a pref preface um, it essentially an interest rate that that investor is um, I hesitate to use the word guarantee but is supposed to be getting right plus an appreciation or a, a share of the equity or, or profit um, so shared appreciation loan they're very common in the commercial world and they're very easy to adapt into the residential world. Okay. Um, that's probably the best term to search in the new search. Shared appreciation. Shared appreciation. Thank you. Yeah. And when you're, when you're looking at these documents, you're primarily looking specifically for the, you're, you're reading the provisions to understand the provisions in a little bit more detail, so you kind of understand what the major provisions are in these agreements, but they're not going to be a replacement for proper legal documents like in a specific state or something no. like that. You need to get an attorney involved in something no. like that. If you want to save a bunch of money when you go to an attorney, Cut and paste here, cut and paste here, <laughs> have a document ready, send it over to them. That way they're not putting it all together because attorneys love it when you pull together a bunch of documents. Duct tape, super glue. I have a comment on this. Yeah. I, I, I see some, you, it's like, oh, I, this was from this site, and that was from that site, and none of it makes any sense. That's why I said in the very beginning, forget all that for a minute. If you're going to go see an attorney, save yourself some money and help your attorney by just thinking logically through the deal and, t and literally typing it in a bullet point or one, two, three steps, how you plan to do this deal, how you plan to acquire, 
who's going to invest. It's really the, the, the best way to do it is just to think through. My cl a classic, um, uh, you know, here, log one one here is a common agreement. Is first paragraph is the parties, and then you have what are called recitals. Here's what we plan to do. We are going to buy a property at 123 Easy Street. Two, we are going to redevelop the property. We are going to add uh, a uh, master bedroom on the property, or we're just going to refinish it and paint it, okay? We expect that it's going to cost this much money. Um, you know, we are going to acquire the property for this. Um, we will have investors. This is what our projected timeline is. And you just, just boom, boom, boom. These are all the facts that lead up to, to putting this deal together. And then how you get people out, which is usually to close that best grow. Who hires, who has a responsibility and ability to hire the broker, who has decision making on that, and just lay that all out. That way, if you go see an attorney um, for these deals, you've, you've already thought it through. And, and it's really fascinating, the difference between you telling somebody what you're going to do and then writing it down is, is night and day. And it's oh, yeah. really so helpful to me if I can see the thought flow, so then I can catch it. It's like, okay, we need to get a real problem here before you ask me to review a document that's garbage. Because then I'll spend your money reviewing garbage <laughs> as opposed to you just, you just writing out what your deal points are, speaking of a napkin. And I just want to point out, David and I were talking about this the other day. When your deals, you do a few of these and, and things, you, you do do a syndication. I think this is fascinating. And now as an attorney, when uh, um, LegalZoom came out, I was a corporate attorney at the time. And I was charging in, you know, 1998, I was charging $2,500 or $3,000 for a simple incorporation because I could, because we did them, right? And, and then LegalZoom came out and you can get them online for 300 bucks, right? So that marketplace went away. It didn't take my job away because people always do them wrong. But, but there's a very interesting program now. It's a, a woman who's worked for like Realty Mobile and some others. And she's, her website is called Bootstrap Legal. Yes, you know Amy? Oh my gosh, she's great. And so what she's done is she's applied that same um, kind of theory in that she sees many smaller investors doing deals without the proper documentation. So what she has these packages and she has this, because of technology, this is now so doable because she has this entire matrix of questions. You know, A, B, A goes to C and then you know, if it's B, it goes down here and it cascades. So she can do a, a syndication agreement for you and like they're five to eight grand and you get a couple hours of legal um, uh, attorney review along with the document. Now for many of you, based on what you're saying, you're not there yet, but keep it in the back of your mind and, and you know, does it take away some business for some securities attorneys? Maybe, but it also provides an avenue for people who couldn't afford a 20 to $30,000 syndication fee to, to actually prepare some appropriate documents. I think it's phenomenal. I think our first fund was almost $100,000 put together. Before we could go out and raise dollar one, to give you an idea of how much it can cost. Um, I will say one other thing, but probably the best advice I was ever given was early on in my career. And my mentor at the time said, he goes, listen, I want you to just look at every transaction as when you're sitting in front of a jury, how they're gonna look at it. And, and, he, and he said, the further away it is from the norm of a transaction, the guiltier you look. <laughs> right? So if you have a hard time explaining it somewhere, and something goes wrong, yeah, you look pretty bad. Yeah. Robert, what's the most creative apartment to leave that most creative. So the question was, what's the most creative apartment deal I've ever done? Um, Creative. Uh, that's a great question. So we bought a property in Long Beach. It was 16 units, and this is—I mean, the price is big. This is making huge money. <laughs> and we paid uh, two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars for a 16-unit, all-two bedroom, three-story elevator building. No, no, it was nineteen ninety-four. Um, 
And uh, the creative part was we had to, the seller, uh, this is a time where there were no short sales. So the creative part was he had more debt on the property than what we were paying and was in danger of losing it. Didn't want to lose it because he was a higher net worth guy, but the building was completely vacant and had to essentially orchestrate a reduction of the value and then getting the bank to move over some of the debt to one of his other performing assets, which was, you know, at the time when they didn't have a departments, getting to just the right person, you know, and hearing, I mean, quite literally, probably 50 people say, he just has to make the payments, you know, and finally getting to the right spot to get it put together. And, and at the time being 24 years old or something like that, 23 years old, and um, having no money to like actually go and put this deal together, uh, finding then the investor to do, which you know actually came pretty easily, um, you know, putting it together and then figuring out that I hated uh, managing an apartment building and I bought myself a job, which sucks, right? Because you didn't want to do that. I thought, wow, this is great. So we figured out that we could flip apartment buildings, you know, but the creative part was just actually getting to the closing on buying it. And, and not so much the structure of the deal itself. The structure was pretty, we found one single investor that came in and bought the property with us. We actually created an LLC with them. It was kind of a, a pseudo partnership and we probably did it incorrectly. <laughs> but it was a friend of the family who said, yeah, this, that sounds great, 225, we're gonna get how much income out of it? I don't know, I think we're gonna get, uh, what was it, 9,000 a month off of this building, but we were paying 225, right? It sounds like a great deal at the time. I was passing on deals that were three times gross. And it's like, oh, that's too much. We'll pay two and a half times gross. Which means that two and a half times of the annualized income is what my offer price would be. And so people now pay 12 times gross. <laughs> yeah. Craig, I got a question you mentioned before about the idea of I have two pools of money. One, one is in my IRA, one's in my bank account. Which one should I use? But a lot of times people want to use both of them. <laughs> can, can you talk about credit transactions and self a little bit? That's why I love David. Okay. Well, don't do that. <laughs> okay, can you, can you invest with yourself and your IRA? All right. Uh, all right. Don't do it. But there is the Department of Labor has a ruling. Because like you said, you know, you got to sit in front of a, a, an IRS auditor and explain how you had no personal benefit from that deal. Well, if it's you and your IRA money, of course you benefited. Because you, you made money, you benefited. So how do you prove you didn't benefit? But the IRA, they did come up with a ruling, DOL 2000, for the year 2000-10, okay, that's the ruling. Where they say something to the effect of, you know, if you if you already have all the money, you have plenty of money personally in your IRA, and you just decide to invest together. You know, we, we decide to co-mingle or you know, invest. Come in, yeah, yeah those funds. Then it's cool, yeah. And uh, that's what your 2000 10 says. But I wouldn't touch with the 10 whole because I could never prove to the IRS that I didn't get personal benefit. And personal benefit is one of the prohibited transactions. Real quick on prohibited transactions. No personal benefit, so you don't owe money to yourself. And by the way, disallowed people, lineal ascendants and descendants, anybody Catholic, you'll get this. Okay, so you, you can't, no, no ascendants and descendants, but the people out to the sides are okay, all right? So no parents, grandparents, you and your spouse, children, grandchildren, you don't invest with them, they're disallowed people, but brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, uh, cousins, uh, they're okay, all right? So disallowed people. So, and so can your IRA make a note to your son? No, he's a disallowed person. Can your IRA buy a house and then your daughter lives there? No, she's a disallowed person, prohibited transaction. Prohibited transaction means game over for your, for your IRA. And so that's really important. So your IRA doesn't do business, but I think um, with prohibited transactions, really what we see the most is this little phrase that says, you can't provide goods, services, or facilities to the plan, and how legal does that sound? It's not like a lawyer told me about that, right? Because it's in the Internal Revenue Code. If you're you like a rule book kind of person, you want to write it down, it's IRC for Internal Revenue Code 4975, where you find these rules. But, the, but basically, so so you're a lawyer, and your IRA is going to invest in a deal. Is, is it okay if you get a legal fee for doing the documents? 
No, because you're self-dealing and also you're offering services to the plan. Even if you did it for free, you're offering services to the plan. So uh, we have, well, with, with real estate, we had somebody buying a, a piece of property here in California, and so their name is, we'll just say Smith, right? So we're, you know, it's all vested correctly, it looks all beautiful, we're going through, going through, you know, the car document, what happened? It's like, like an encyclopedia, you know, so it's the last case. Attorneys have it. Oh, well, we love attorneys too. But at the bottom, you can see who's the broker of record, like who's the selling thing, right? It's the guy's dad, the last name's the same, so we have to get him to write us an email and explain who this person is with the same last name to know that they're not just a lot of people. He says, oh, that's my dad. So not only did he want to be the broker of record on the deal, which is offering services to the plan, he wanted a commission. So it's two prohibited transactions right there. So that's another the reason why you call us before you do a deal. We're going to ask you all these things. I want to take a look at your docs before it funds. Um, whether or not it's a prohibited transaction is 100% of your shoulders. But well, what are we here for? You know, we're going to look at it. We're going to look at it. And if we see something, we're going to tell you. But can you, you get a mortgage for self retirement? Can the IRA get down payment money? Or can you, get you know, that's like the most frequently asked question. Which is what? Can an, oh, so I'll repeat it so that everybody else knows what it is. Uh, can an IRA take on a mortgage? And the answer is yes, but it's it's not the kind of mortgage you think. It's not like the kind of we just go personally to buy, go buy a property of you know, any kind. It's not a Freddie, Fannie, FHA, VA, conventional loan conforming, none of that. It is what's called a non-recourse loan. Now, non-recourse has a lot of meanings, right? But in this case, what this means is it's not a loan to you. So it's not a loan, it doesn't matter um, your FICO score, it doesn't matter how much income you earn, it's because it's not a loan to you. It's a loan to the IRA and for the property. So they're gonna, the underwriter's gonna look at this property and how much, what's the cash flow of this property? That's almost like 98% of what they're underwriting, the cash is a good deal. Yeah, and so they're gonna look at location and condition like a normal underwriter, but is, you know, what's the cash flow? So if the IRA defaults on the loan, then they can only come against the pro such a property, not against you as a person, not against any other asset in your IRA. And so that's how an IRA can take on money. Now when an IRA does that, back to the tax thing. This is the UDFI, Unrelated Debt Finance Income Tax. If you want to rule book again, if you want to read about it, it's uh, IRS, their website, irs.gov, look at publication 598. It will talk about these twin taxes and talk to a tax person. But so your IRA borrows money. Well say for example, you, you buy a house, I don't know where can you buy a house for $100,000, like Sacramento maybe? Yeah. Like, 
Why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you do it? Yeah, because um, right now I feel like, man, that must be huge. Well, it's fun, you know, when we're talking to talk about all the blood and you know, gory stories, you know, because they're fun yeah. uh, to talk about. But we, we you know, I'm feeling I'm like, like, I'm feeling yeah, the news, the news. Yeah. But what we, we do like, hundreds of transactions every week, right. right? People buying different kinds of real estate. So people do this. Um, our industry, like it just came back from Washington, we've discovered that our industry is sitting on at least a hundred billion in assets. So, you know, nothing to sneeze at. It we probably only more. about 3% oh, of do real all. estate. And is that just because it's so freaking complicated? No. Or, that's okay. So she's saying, if only 3% if only invest in real estate using retirement funds, is it because it's complicated? No, it's because they don't know they can. Okay. If, because, for example, you watch the Super Bowl, you know, and you see the Shankopotamus ad, right? But you're never, you see the, you see, right, from the, 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 the broker dealer, or you see some, you know, uh, what are, some other broker dealer is going to have an ad, and they can pay for it. How are they paying for that? Hmm. Where do they make money? Hmm. Self-directed IRAs, we're not making money on your deal, so we're not advertising. Even as an industry, we're looking at doing national advertising on, on a national level. It's so expensive. That, that, and we don't make, we're not like participating in the profit of your deal, so we're not, because we don't advertise. So the thing. biggest disadvantage maybe of why someone wouldn't do it is just that it, it could be a little bit complicated. Why people won't invest in real estate yeah. except George and I have yeah. a list of things. Yeah. One, they don't really understand real estate. That could be, and they say, okay. hey, real estate isn't my thing. I don't really understand it. I'm not going to do it. Uh, number two, it, the attitude of, I don't know where we got this attitude, but it's just, just, it's just you, just you, just deal with it. I don't even want to look at it. It's you just yes. deal with my money. Well, that's what people said to Bernie Madoff, and that's what he did. Madoff, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so because people don't want to take responsibility for for themselves, I mean, it's just human. We're human beings, and that's a human thing. So, so there's that. Hey, Kakar, if yeah. I can ask you, she yeah. asked, like, what are some of the biggest hurdles? I, I think when yeah. she was talking about yeah. self-dealing and dealing with your friends and family. Like prohibited transactions. The prohibited transaction is probably yeah. the biggest hurdle. Yeah. If you stay away from dealing with yourself okay. or dealing with your immediate family members, and we've been talking a lot about debt versus equity here, if your IRA is a uh, is dealing in debt, and, and it, it's it's a far simpler if you're right. lending money out of your IRA to someone else and getting paid back, that's a very clear, yeah. simple transaction. Okay, okay, thank you. Trust if, if, if you're trying to borrow money, we're talking, but no, we talked a lot about all these complicated things, syndication. I don't know any of that so, stuff. So that's helpful because right now I feel like wow, I don't think I want to do that because it's not so complicated, but it's not that complicated. It's actually pretty simple. And, and, yeah. Yeah, the, the simplest yeah. way well, why don't we talk about, that. but let's talk about the simple stuff then. Let's, yeah. let's go yeah. simple for a second, because it's fun to... The data trust, just, I mean, if you're just, if, yeah. there, there's a lot of investors that, like, if he buys something, I might put my order with him, and he put his with mine, if it was me, and then there's no self deal in there. And, yeah. and, but you're, essentially, you can do that with anyone, right? Just be a lender to someone else, and then you're just, I mean, it's, it's simple paperwork. It's just a deed of trust. You're a note holder, that's your investment. That's it. Yeah. Okay. You know, your IRA can lend money to somebody, even to buy a car, you know, and then they make their car payment back to your IRA. Yeah. You know, like like a, a friend kind of a loan. You could yeah. you can even do that. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's as simple as for investing. You're basically just you open the account, there's usually what, two hundred and seventy dollar a year. Two seventy five, yeah. That, so it's pretty it's not that expensive. And then you're basically you fill out what's called a bi direction letter and you submit that with the paperwork saying, Hey, custodian, please fund this investment, here's all the paperwork. Within twenty four hours, again, here you go, wired into the closing or wherever you need it. Um, that's usually the case with a good custodian. Some of the custodians can be um, it take a little bit more time or be disorganized. But um, but other than that it's pretty simple yeah. to actually make it the biggest challenge is did you do the due diligence on that deal in the first place? Yeah. You know, think of your IRA as the lender, right? And not as, I mean, because you can't buy properties in your IRA, but it, it's much, that becomes more complicated than the simple transaction of just being a lender. We, we had a question back here, and I'll take more about it in a second. Yeah, uh, this is a little bit different from uh, other stuff. So there, obviously, there's a lot of people who like uh, lease out properties, who take long term leases of properties, and they have leases in the short term rental market. Like, yeah, we have to do that. Yeah, so is there a way like uh, to get funding from that, or is it technically is it not collateral in that like, it's really hard to get? Well, so I'll tell you, the, the way I would look at it, okay, so the question was um, with the, 
with the short-term rental market, is there a way to get borrow money against the income of a short-term rental? Is that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah? Okay. So um, I'll tell you the way I've always looked at short-term rentals. There's the value of the real estate, right, and what the income would be as a long-term rental and the normal market, and then there's the business, which is the short-term rental. Right? And that business, which is more labor intensive, creates that extra value. And so I bifurcate the two instead of looking at it as one because if I foreclose on your property, I'm not going to run the short term rental. I'm only going to be able to rent it out for what I can, what the market would pay as a long term rental. And so your business is one is hospitality, right? And then your other business is, is the rental. And so I look at just the value of the rental itself and not the upside of the hospitality because. That's not the business I'm going to run. Now, there are probably lenders out there that would look at giving you some sort of upside if you've got a long enough track record and a big enough portfolio that say, okay, this is the business, and if you know if something happens to Joseph, then he has a business in place that it, it, it keeps going, and then there's more security in that. Um, but it, you know, to say that uh, that a small lender or an investor would do it, I, I would look at it two different. Yeah, I think there are lenders out there right now that will loan you the funds or a percentage of the funds on your, you know, initial setup costs and things like that for short-term rentals, even if you don't own the property, even if you're subleasing or something like that. Uh, but, you know, it's a very low collateral. It's hard to resell really that collateral. So the rates are ridiculously high. The payback terms are high you know, because there is no collateral involved or real collateral. And they're betting on you as an operator. You know, they're still underwriting the cash flow of the deal, but they're betting on you as the operator to do that aspect, you know. So, um, a question in the back to the side, and then I'll move on a little bit. Yeah, if you uh, purchase a property with a self directed IRA and you're over 59 and a half, are there any other type of restrictions in terms of receiving distributions outside of the normal IRA rules? When you're 15, so he's saying, if you, once you turn 59 and a half, are there any restrictions? You know, when you're self directed IRA, your IRA is investing, right? So when you're 59 and a half, that's when you hit the mark that you can take, like in a traditional, a pre tax account, like a traditional or a SEP or a simple IRA, where you can t take the money out without a penalty. In a Roth, you can take the money out, assuming you have the Roth five years, you can take the money out tax free once you hit that magic 59 and a half number. So that's cool. But I think what you're thinking of is the 70 and a half number where you're required, you have required minimum distributions and you have to take the money out. And yes, there are restrictions there. So when you turn 70 and a half, you can't contribute to a traditional IRA anymore. You can only contribute to a Roth if, if you have a job. Okay, that's one thing. Um, if your IRA owns a house and you're 70 and a half, you can't contribute anymore. Um, and you have to take RMDs. And you know, you don't want to, we're talking about, like we're going in the weeds, but and not, but you're asking me the questions, so I'm gonna answer it, okay? So you're 70 and a half, your IRA owns a house, every year you've got to take an RMD, and so you hope you hopefully you've got cash in that. So you, it's all of your IRAs combined, there's a factor. So you take the value of all your retirement accounts combined times that factor equals the amount of your required minimum distribution every year. So if you don't have that cash to take out and you have to use your hard assets, you might want to liquidate your property at that point. Because what you have to do otherwise is every single year have the IRA pay for an appraisal and pay for a title company to, re to retitle um, like a certain percentage into your own name as a distribution. I think what he's thinking is you can take a rent out. You can, you can, but it has to go to your IRA first, right. and then you can withdraw it. So you can never do take it. personal use of your IRA funds. It goes back in the IRA first, and then goes to you. You can all, regardless of your age, you can always have your IRA money back. It's whether or not you pay taxes or penalties. Yeah. Yeah. But there, there are those magic numbers of 59 and a half when it's penalty free, yeah. and 70 and a half when you have required minimum distributions. Your question? Well, no, I was just going to respond to her question about why don't people do this. And Matt and I talk about this all the time. They don't teach financial education in high school. Oh, well said. Right? It all goes back to that. And so as adults, our kids and we have all just become, we became lazy and said, oh, they know best. And so our retirement funds all went into mutual funds and stocks and our IRAs when we worked for large corporations, where it was all done for us. And so we just sat back and said, oh, well, there it is. 
and that's going to take care of me when I retire. And we just gave up control. And so we have to start educating people, our friends, our family, our clients, to take that control. If you want to see a really good video about that, you know John Oliver, he's just so yeah. funny. Oh, yeah. you Google John Oliver and look up teacup pigs, okay? And, and because there's this hysterical, uh, Randy goes on talking really about what, what 401k companies are going to earn off of your savings. It's, it's incredibly insightful, precise, brilliant, and he breaks it up with little stories about teacup pigs to make it interesting. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Well, and, and I'll say keep coming to Phoebe too, right? Like, you're, yes. you're all here. You know, I think that's yeah. um, You know, that's the whole part of coming to Phoebe is the fact that we are sharing information back and forth. So we appreciate you guys coming tonight. It's 9 o'clock, so we're going to wrap it up. Um, let me get a round of applause for our panelists. If you have other questions, um, you know, they're all going to uh, join us over at North Italia. So please, you know, once you get over there, you've got questions, come in. If you've got specific questions about your scenario, that's a great time. You either ask them or maybe grab a business card and set up a time to discuss later. Um, like I mentioned, uh, we're going to go ahead and clear everyone out. When you walked in, you walked into that far door all the way to the other end of the building. When you leave, if you go right down this hallway through here, there's a door, there's a set of stairs right behind us that literally will bring you out where you can kind of get over to the restaurant a lot quicker. So uh, use that. Uh, I forget the